Part 1 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. You will hear two students, Peter and Mary, planning their weekend. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Well, Mary, you're free this weekend and so am I, so let's plan the agenda. We said we're going to see a movie on Saturday, right? Yes. But what time? It's cheapest in the afternoon and very expensive at night, of course, so let's go in the afternoon. Sounds good. Have some fun before preparing that night for all our studies. But you mentioned that new action movie. Sure. Well, that's what you want to see, but I'd rather see that comedy. I thought we'd agreed on the action movie. You just said that you'd like it. I didn't. My friends tell me my movie is very funny, too. OK, I'm fine with that. A comedy it is. We can see my action film another time. So that's Saturday afternoon planned, and that night we'll just eat at a restaurant. Where? I don't have much money, but there are some nice cheap places near the cinema. What about Pizza King? I'm not that keen on pizza, actually. There's a noodle place near there. What about that? Oh, I really wanted to eat pizza. And you know how fattening pizza is, and not nearly as healthy as noodles either. OK, OK, we'll do it your way again. Noodles it is. OK, that's Saturday done. But Sunday, we have to study, right? You bet. We'd better start early too. 10am, let's say. We can meet in the library about that time. OK, let me write that in my diary. But ten in the morning is a bit late, don't you think? We've got a lot to do, so I should think 9am is the very latest we should meet. 9am? Sunday morning? Are you serious? What about 9.30? No, it's important to be disciplined, so I'll be there at that earlier time. All right, all right, 9am. The early bird catches the worm or passes the exam, right? Right. But should we study for the science class or the maths one? Or even history. There's so much to study. Well, let's just stick to the original plan. Science, right? Yeah. We can study for maths another time. OK, that's decided. Now, that just leaves the afternoon. But there's lunch first. I think we can have my choice of restaurant this time. That's only fair. But the university cafeteria is not far, and cheap too. But I thought we could have pizza. There's a nice sandwich bar there, and that's a healthier option. I'm doing this for your own good. Look at you, Peter. You're already overweight. OK, OK. We'll take the healthy option again. Sandwiches it is, and you'll thank me for this later. Yeah, yeah. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, Mary, I think we've planned our day well, but I've always wanted to ask you what you think of our course of study. I think it's good. Very good, in fact. So do I. Apart from some of the teachers. What do you mean? Well, our maths tutor, Mr Vernon, is OK. Sure. But he doesn't seem to care much about the subject matter. But he knows his stuff. I think he's excellent. I'm surprised you don't think so too. He's satisfactory, as I said, but I just like him to care more or try a bit harder. But he's smart and explains things well. What more could you want? Just for him to have more passion about what he does. He could be more like, say, Mr Harrison. Mr Harrison is always late, though, and he's never well prepared. Rushes in, notes falling everywhere, a complete mess. But it's his attitude that matters. Mr Harrison wants to help students. He has passion, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, a passion for disorganisation and presenting things in a very confusing way. That's why I like Miss Whitehead. She comes on time and presents everything very clearly with her PowerPoint displays. But she's also rather mechanical. She just clicks buttons and the PowerPoint shows another slide. Very clear slides. And she explains it clearly as well. And that's the most important thing. But she's not connecting much with the students. Ah, come on. Only the bad students are not paying attention. All the rest, those who really care, are listening and the information is given clearly, concisely and she knows her stuff. I don't deny that. I'm just saying that a truly good teacher needs a human connection with the students. Without that, teachers ultimately fail in their purposes and thus she must be considered a failure. Phew! You are a tough one to please, I'll say that much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a hospital administrator telling some visitors about the hospital where she works. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone. Welcome to Stanford Hospital, one of the more progressive hospitals in the Greater Southern Health District. Now, one of the ways we have achieved our high status is through implementing certain rules that you may not necessarily find in other centres of care. One of the most important is washing hands. Everyone who enters this hospital must wash their hands. We have signs indicating this and special sinks installed to allow visitors to follow this rule. Did you know that the majority of lethal viruses and bacteria are actually brought in by visitors? And sick people, of course, are very susceptible to such bugs. Thus, the washing hands rule is especially important in certain wards. These have the standard sink near the entrance door and also a bottle of disinfectant spray. So, in addition to washing your hands there, you are expected to spray them as well to kill any bugs that might remain. Annoying? 
Keep in mind that people have died from infections brought in by visitors, and newborn babies are particularly vulnerable in this respect. This is why the special care nursery definitely uses this system. Annoying? Not at all. Merely a necessity for a responsible hospital, and every new mother will thank you for it. Now, and on the same theme, most hospitals allow an unlimited number of visitors, four, five, six. But remember, any one of them could be carrying colds or other viruses. For this reason, at the Stanford Hospital, we limit visitor numbers to three, and we are quite strict about this. Again, if you find it annoying, remember that it's for the good of all the patients, and it's what makes our hospital one of the best. To help keep control of this, all visitors must enter through the visitor gate, and there is a guard to tally up numbers and ensure that this rule is being followed. Now, the smoking policy. Most hospitals allow some sort of smoking somewhere on the premises, but here at Stanford, we believe that tolerating this habit at any time in any place is contrary to good health and the ethos of care. Consequently, we have a blanket ban: smoking on the premises or immediate vicinity is banned completely. We are aware that such rules are often ignored, not only in hospitals but also in many public buildings. Well, we take this rule so seriously that we have undertaken preventative measures. Smoke detectors are in place. We have many video cameras installed, and if people break this rule or any others, security will be alerted. But we're sure that won't happen once people understand that at Stanford, our goal is to be the very best hospital in the world. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Now, after having given you all those Stanford Hospital rules today, let me move on to a brief history of the place. It first opened in 1955, when it was known as the Southern General Hospital. It ran under this name until the 1980s. After which it changed to the present name and was enlarged with the addition of two buildings: the Matheson Building and the Western Wing. Although it was the second of these which first began operations in 1984, leaving the Matheson Building to open one year later, and other extensions such as the rear annex to appear only in recent times. The Matheson Building housed the maternity wards, while the Western Wing was for infectious diseases, and they still have those functions today. An interesting event was the fire which broke out just after the rear annex was constructed. It was found that some faulty wiring linked to the main transformer caused the fire, starting in the central building. Spreading out to the medical library, Western Wing, and the pediatric section. Fortunately, no lives were lost, although the damage bill was considerable. Apart from that, it's been pretty much plain sailing for the hospital, allowing it to gain the high regard in which it is held today. Now, do you have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3. You will hear a student Eric talking to his lecturer, Mrs. Harris, about some study difficulties. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Mrs. Harris. I really liked your lecture, by the way. Oh, thank you. Glad it was interesting. So, how can I help you? Well, why do you think I need help? You just don't look too happy. I admit I'm having some difficulties. About what? Oh, it's hard to say exactly. All the reading is quite a chore, but I'm handling it. What really wears me down are the assignments. The reading load is just part of the course, but sure, the assignments take more time, more effort. And you know how you have to use what you read in your assignments. That's right. That's the point of the readings. Well, the reading passages also seem, well... Boring? No, not boring, but it's hard to connect it all, to remember what the readings are about, if you know what I mean. Well, I'd advise you to write a small summary at the back of each reading text. Really? Absolutely. Basically, you don't want to be going through these texts again and again, and you'll need to refer to them often. So, write a small summary, and when you revisit these texts, just read these. I'm not too sure how to write a summary, though. It's easy enough. The important thing is to check that you've written the main point and not just a list of details in order of their appearance. Details are not what matters, so again, don't make a list of these. That will just waste valuable time and you're going to get very busy soon enough. Usually these articles argue a point or otherwise have a certain purpose. So think all the time, what's the point and what's the purpose? Okay. And just write that? Not just that. You have to think about the supporting points also. Then you might wish to cite some evidence. You can decide that yourself. But what's the most important thing about a summary? That it's accurate? No, that it's short. After all, it's a summary, right? So, main point, supporting point, some evidence, and most importantly, keep it short, OK? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, those points about writing summaries sound useful, but what about the actual formatting of the summary, on paper I mean? Are there any other points I should know about? Yes, there's a lot actually. It's very important to... Write clearly? Write the author's name. But the author's name is in the text anyway. But it must also be in your summary. And you must always lead with this. For example, Peter Brown argues that, and so on. So the author's name is Peter Brown? Yes, and the actual summary continues from there. And here's another good hint. Always write the citation details at the top using bullet points. This makes these details clearer and easier to see, and immediately means you're not plagiarising the text. You are acknowledging the source, which is academic and required. This also allows you to quickly write these details down later, if you paraphrase or quote from either the summary or the original text. What details go in the citation? The year of publication is obviously important, but here's another tip. Make sure whatever you're reading is not more than 10 years old. 
Anything older than that is considered too dated, since business theory moves on fairly quickly. You can cite older texts, but only under special conditions. What are they? Well, if the text is a very well-known book, a classic of its kind, but then you have to indicate that in your writing, acknowledge that the book is dated. But then give a justification about why you nevertheless felt the need to use it. I see. So you'll have a lot of summaries for all the text, but with such clear formatting, you'll be able to access information quickly. But make sure you store these pages in an order, of course, alphabetical, based on the author's family names, is the simplest method. Or in order of date, chronological order. That's possible too. But I'd say alphabetical is always the best. My friends say chronological order has more advantages. Any system is fine, provided that it's logical and that you can follow it and quickly access your summaries at a later date. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer discussing the marketing and consumption of kangaroo meat. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. When one thinks of Australia, one of the first images that comes to mind is of the kangaroo. This native marsupial is cute, unusual, and with the baby kangaroo, known as a joey, safely in its mother's pouch, it presents an enduring image often seen on Australian postcards and posters. Yet these animals breed prolifically. And have been highly favoured by the widespread clearing of forest and bushland in the past to provide land for the traditional sheep and cattle industry. Ironically, kangaroos breed in such numbers, up to 50 million per year generally, that they have become pests. Consequently, for a long time now, there has been a yearly cull. In other words, their numbers are reduced with controlled and accurate shooting. And here we are talking of shooting millions of them. In the past, the carcasses were simply left out in the bush. Then later, some of the meat was used as cat food, and still is, in fact. It is only in recent years that the meat has been used for human consumption, primarily for the overseas market, and one can see why. The meat is, by all accounts, leaner and tenderer than beef. It has a strong taste and minces easily, but it also has some more subtle advantages, and this is a topic I'd like to explore now. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions thirty-four to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-four to forty. Now there is a market, small but growing, for kangaroo meat, and one interesting reason to encourage its consumption is that it is environmentally friendly to do so, and this itself is for three reasons. 
One, the traditional cattle and sheep, which mostly fill the rural pastures of Australia, are introduced species and somewhat destructive to the environment. After all, they weren't meant to be there in the first place. Their eating habits destroy the root systems of grass. Their hard hooves tear open the ground, and their droppings are heavy and smothering to new growth. Kangaroos, in contrast, have all the opposite traits. They are a native animal existing in harmony with the natural environment there. So, replacing cattle with kangaroos makes good sense. The other benefit is that, unlike cows and sheep, kangaroos don't produce methane as a byproduct of their digestion. And methane, along with carbon dioxide, is one of the primary agents of global warming. Finally, since there are too many kangaroos anyway, culling their population for their meat increases the biodiversity of Australia's wildlife. In other words, wallabies, quokkas, wombats, and other native animals are given space to increase their numbers also, in the way that it was meant to be before the bushland was extensively cleared. So, one would think such arguments make the case irrefutable. However, there are some serious issues to overcome. The biggest problem is the way eating this meat is perceived. Many people still feel uneasy about eating what is, in effect, a national symbol, and a cute one at that. As well as this perception problem, kangaroos cannot be domesticated or raised within enclosures, as can conventional cattle. Kangaroos simply leap over fences, meaning that it is wild kangaroos that are harvested, which is not always efficient or cost-effective. This process involves trucks, shooters, spotlights, and many people to assist in transporting carcasses from remote location. Finally, the public are not that happy with guns being the tool to cull these animals, arguing that it is inhumane. Professional shooters are, of course, trained, licensed, and follow a strict code of practice. They use accurate weapons and always aim for the head. The kill, in theory, is instantaneous, yet not necessarily in all cases. Thus, videos of kangaroo shooting taken by animal rights activists can cause great problems for the industry. Yet, what the public needs to realise is that, ultimately, all of their meat requires the killing of animals. And what happens in cattle abattoirs is, in essence, no different to what happens during the average kangaroo cull. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.